Good afternoon, everybody. So today we have two lectures. The first is from David Abel talking about research. And the second is where the TAs and I will talk about productivity and some of our tips for time management. And as a reminder, David is with DeepMind and DeepMind may be interested in sharing today's lecture to a wider audience. So because of that, I'm going to explain a little bit about this course so that you have context of why are we talking about research and how does it fit in? So this class is part of Harvard IACS, the Institute for Applied Computational Science. And we're not part of any single department, but we are within SEAS, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So we all come from a bunch of different backgrounds, some of us from astrophysics, some from applied math. I'm a computer scientist. And in addition to our research, we center around two master's programs, data science, and computational science and engineering. Regardless of the master's program that our students select, there are two main ways to graduate. Students can either select the master's thesis option or the capstone research course option, this course. So this is our flagship course. And what is it about? Well, its entire purpose is to prepare students for post-graduation. And we do this by having students work in teams on real world projects. So before the semester begins, I reach out to a bunch of different organizations, and this list of organization, of organization changes every semester, uh, but I reach out to these, and I craft with them some projects that I think would be super challenging and good for our students to work on. And it is very important to me to have diversity in these companies. So on this slide, you see a list of our partners from last last semester in the fall and this semester in the spring. And yeah, some of these projects can, are you know, from big software companies. Some are small, some are NGOs, others are startups. Uh, some are from biotech and others from local government, such as city of Somerville. And students use the knowledge that they've learned in their classes to solve these hard, you know, complex problems, these computational problems. And inevitably, some of these problems will uh, require learning just new stuff that they've not seen before. Uh, sometimes the data will be missing. Sometimes the data will be messy, just like what you'll encounter in industry. It's also really important to me to prepare the students for post-graduation by not only providing them with, you know, or helping them with computational models and getting, you know, the best possible accuracy that they can get, but providing the students with some of these supplemental skills, um, skills that I believe are not traditionally taught uh, in a typical curriculum. Skills such as public speaking or how to work on a team, how to manage software, uh, being aware of some of the common pitfalls that exist within any data science or computer science project and skills such as research, which is why we have David here today. So David Abel finished his PhD at Brown last year. Uh, that's how we know each other. We were both PhD students there. David's area of interest uh, is reinforcement learning. And you may know David uh, from his famous conference notes. Uh, I don't know how you do it, David, but uh, yeah, he takes these meticulous notes at various research conferences. And, you know, you must have some incredible keyboard shortcuts and stuff because by the end of the conference, he'll have typed up 60 to 90 pages of meticulous notes about all the talks and all the workshops that he attended. So you can check these out online. Again, David is a research scientist at DeepMind now. So we are very happy to have you here, David. Let's give a warm welcome to him and the floor is yours. Awesome, thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. I'm gonna get the uh, slides shared, let's see. Thanks again to Chris for, for inviting me to be here and thanks for everyone for, for chiming in. Um, super excited to give to give this talk and, and to discuss with you all. Um, I, I really love research and I really believe in, in, in the power of research to kind of transform society over generations. And I think one fun and kind of unanswered aspect of research is just how to do it. And we all kind of figured out on the fly just from trying it out. And so here's just today in, in this talk, I'm just going to give a collection of insights that I've picked up from some of my mentors, some of my friends, collaborators. Just kind of a mixture of thoughts that 
shape how I think about research that I hope you find helpful too. And to start with, I want to have us think about a little ant puzzle that I find quite fun and that we'll use as a running example for some parts of the talk. Uh, my friend Ellis first gave me this puzzle uh, while we were hiking in Oregon many, many years ago, and uh, now seems like a lifetime ago. Um, the setup of the puzzle, so we suppose we have a bunch of ants, in particular 100 ants on this, uh, on a, a one meter log. Um, in particular, we'll imagine it's just in a 1D plane, so there's no kind of walking around the cylindrical part of the log, but just horizontally making progress. Um, each ant is going to be placed at a single point somewhere in this interval um, from the start of the log to the end of the log by some adversary. They get to pick where the ants lie. Um, we'll set each ant either pointing to the left or to the right, again, chosen by the adversary. And then the adversary, once they've placed all of our ants on the log, they'll click a stopwatch and then kind of the, the ant universe will start and all the ants will start marching forward in whatever direction they were originally facing at a speed of one meter per second. Uh, the trick is that when two ants collide, they bounce off of one another, change direction, so they start facing exactly the opposite direction, and then continue forward. And crucially, um, the ants, when they reach the edge of the log, they fall off. And the question we'll ask here is, what is the maximum number of seconds it will take in order for all of the ants to have fallen off the log? OK, does the question make sense? And the setup makes sense to everybody. Any clarifying questions on this? OK, so I'll give folks maybe just 30 seconds or so just to kind of think about it to yourselves. And then we'll hop into uh, breakout rooms and kind of discuss amongst the group to try and try and answer this question um, as a little instance of a, of a research problem. And feel free to, if any additional clarifying questions do pop up as you're thinking about it, uh, feel free to ask, of course. So David, how many, um, how many people per breakout room would you like? Well, let's see, there were about 20 folks total, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So hoping maybe groups of three or four or something like that. Okay. Does that work? And how many minutes do you think? I mean, this doesn't have to be exact. I'm just saying, you know, to give the students a heads up as to how long they have. Yeah, totally. Let's say it's about uh, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and create the uh, break rooms now. Perfect. Thanks. All right. We're at full capacity again. Excellent. All right, so I hope you all had fun uh, thinking about this. Does anyone want to share kind of a summary of their group's thoughts on this or uh, any questions or even an answer that you might have come to? Just a any thoughts about the, the puzzle? Yeah, I mean, if you want, I can go first. Uh, so honestly, uh, what we were talking about is that, and what I think is that the answer is, Maybe it's one second because I'm kind of looking at like the most extreme case in which the ants are like in the in 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 the in, in the opposite directions. So they will bounce and go into the opposite direction at one half of a second. And then for them to bounce off, it will be like another one half of, of a second. So at the end, in the most extreme case, you will have like one second. Yeah, I mean that's that's my thought process. Hopefully. Excellent. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Does anyone else have any additional thoughts on this one? We were kind of starting with a small number of ants and trying to reason it up. Uh, I, we didn't get very far other than the fact that these are like extremely fast ants. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I can run one meter per second. Certainly not after COVID. I don't run very much anymore. Um, yeah. But that's a that's a good observation, definitely. And yeah, and I love the idea of starting with with a couple ants as well. I think it helps to to kind of isolate that that sub problem. Um, any additional thoughts on this? Um, our group uh, thought about kind of some extreme scenarios. So one mm -hmm. extreme is lined up in one direction, and then they would just walk off the log one by one. And in that case, we think that would take a hundred seconds. 
Mm. Um, and then uh, the other extreme scenario is where every end is alternating with the next end. So they all have different directions. Uh, so these are the two that we considered. And then for the alternating case, we just kind of thought about it. So uh, the edge uh, ends on the edge, they will just walk off in one, uh, the log in one second. And then the next pair that's closest to the edge will take two steps, I mean, two meters. And mm -hmm. then uh, the, uh, after they bounce and then they change direction. And then the third uh, pair next to the edge, they will bounce and then walk off in three seconds. So mm -hmm. it's, we think it's a geometric sum that is one plus two plus three uh, until plus 50. Um, and then that will turn out to be one, two, seven, five if we assume they don't take any seconds to change directions. Mm, nice. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I, I love the different perspectives uh, that y'all are bringing to this question. Um, this is great. A any additional uh, thoughts to share? Any other groups? Okay. All right. Well, thanks for, thanks for humoring me and walking through this puzzle. Uh, for what it's worth, I I think I had maybe like a, it was like a five hour hike or so with my friend Ellis, and it took me pretty much the whole hike to figure this out. So this is a, it was a long problem, um, and I give you you know what we said four minutes. So um, definitely no no pressure to have, have figured out a precise answer. But I will now reveal kind of one way of looking at the problem that I think clarifies the question we're asking in a way that reveals the answer. Um, and this is a theme that I really like in research in general. So the observation is that the process of bouncing that we've defined here on the log, so we have an ant approach another ant, I've labeled one as a green ant here, they bounce and flip directions, is actually equivalent to the operation of an ant passing through another ant. Um, in the sense that we actually, we haven't named the ants. Um, they could all just be arbitrary, we can relabel the ants. And so as a result, we can treat this bounce operation as being substituted by a pass-through operation where we just relabel the ants afterward. Does that make sense? Awesome. So once you have this, this reveal, um, we can go back to our original question and just observe that instead of asking about ants that bounce off of each other, we're now asking about ants that pass through each other. And once we make that slight change to the question we're asking, we really expose the answer. Namely, now we just have a bunch of ants walking on a log with no obstacles, and so it can take at most one second. Um, and the reason I really like this puzzle, there's, there's a few reasons, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of hang on to some insights uh, throughout the course of the talk, um, is that a lot of research I find is trying to expose yourself to those moments of discovery, those little moments of uh, looking at things differently and kind of seeing things in a different light, that, that eureka moment. Um, and there were, we heard a lot of different strategies from you all about how to expose yourself to those eureka moments. So one is um, thinking about this simpler case, focusing on the two ant case or the three ant case. Um, another was trying to model it based on some, some uh, properties you knew about like geometric sums. And so I think all of that is super valuable in research using you know, the knowledge you have, trying to look at it from a, a different perspective and trying to simplify these problems down. Um, Great, so we'll hang on to this example a little bit throughout the talk, um, but just to summarize a few of the, the insights that we came away with here, one of which was that it can be really valuable to simplify the question uh, as one group identified. Um, another thing that I personally find very helpful is to relax the constraints of our answer. So instead of getting the exact max, can we give just some ginormous upper bound to start with and then maybe whittle it down uh, as, as we refine our thinking? Um, another key insight here to me is that once we got the framing right, the answer was very apparent. And I really like this from the perspective of communicating research, because that, that moment of framing things differently, to me, is, is one way you can convey to folks how to think about this problem. Like once you see this equivalence between uh, bouncing and passing through, the answer is quite apparent. And so uh, the, the job of us as communicators of research is to try and identify those moments that help expose the solution to others. Um, lastly, I hope that you found the discussion amongst each other to be really valuable um, for walking through this problem together. Um, thinking on your own can be uh, very valuable, of course, and there's this kind of vision of research as an individual just spending a lot of time maybe in front of a blackboard or with some, some vials of liquid. Um, 
but to me, the, the greatest research is done in collaboration with big groups, with diff different perspectives and different ideas all coming together. Um, excellent. So today in the bulk of the talk, I'm going to give kind of a three-part story to my view of research. Um, I tend to break research into three parts. One is identifying a question that you'd like to ask. The second is answering that question. And then the third is communicating why the results of that, of, of both the, why the question mattered that you picked and how you chose to answer it and why that answer matters. I'm going to spend most of the time on this question. Um, and then depending on how the time goes, I will um, get toward these second parts. Um, but for me, the question is in part, uh, figuring out the right question is one of the, the biggest aspects of research. And so it's one I'd like to spend the most time on. And to start with, um, I want us to, to think about the question of what makes a good question? What makes a good research problem to study? Um, and I'm sure you all probably don't care too much about um, these very fast ants walking along a log. Um, but in fact, we care about just trying to understand the world around us as much as possible. And maybe there's something to be said about ants walking along as, as a piece of understanding, but it's not one of these big juicy questions that kind of ignites our curiosity. And in order to address this, this broader question of how do we get our hand, what does it look like to come up with a good research problem? I want to turn to this piece called You and Your Research by Richard Hamming. Um, Hamming gave a talk uh, at, at Bell Labs to summarize his experience at Bell um, amongst a bunch of great researchers for many years, where he summarizes what he thought was uh, the ingredients of focusing on a good research problem. So he said, great scientists have thought through in a careful way a number of important problems in their field, and they keep an eye on wondering how to attack them. Let me warn you, important problem must be phrased carefully. The three outstanding problems in physics in a certain sense were never worked on while I was at Bell Labs. By important, I mean guaranteed a Nobel Prize and any sum of money you want to mention. We didn't work on three mystery problems. They are not important problems because we do not have an attack. It's not the consequence that makes a problem important. It's that you have a reasonable attack. And I've, I absolutely love this quote. I love this piece in general, and I would definitely recommend taking a look at it in, at some point. I think it's really valuable, not just for research, but just any enterprise, um, whatever it is you might uh, find yourself wanting to work on. But the thing that I really want to emphasize here is this notion of having an, a reasonable attack. Um, I think I would disagree with Hamming in one sense that we probably also want to care about the consequence, and I think he probably did implicitly, um, given these three problems that he mentions. Um, so I, I blacked these, these uh, three problems out for a moment just to get you all to maybe think, wh what did uh, a researcher, I think it was in the late 80s he gave this talk, what did a researcher in the late 80s find to be these three outstanding problems in physics that we can't work on because we don't have a plan of attack? So they were time travel, teleportation, and anti-gravity. Um, and I agree with Hamming, it's, it's hard to fathom that maybe the group of us right now could sit down for however long um, we have left in the class and come up with a plan of attack to make any kind of progress on these three things. Um, but one thing that, that I think forces us to reconcile is how do we know when a problem is an ant problem, namely something that if we sit there and think about it, we can figure it out. And how do we know when something's more like one of these problems, a teleportation or anti-gravity? And facing that question is a really uh, profound challenge facing research, anyone that engages in research, because you need to know if you have a plan of attack. And so I wanted to offer a few insights as to hints you can get as to whether or not you might have a, a plan of attack for a given question. Um, so the first of which to emphasize is to look around at the tools you have available. Um, there's this common adage, right? If you have a hammer, then all problems will look like nails. And whatever tools you have assembled for yourself or your team, um, those are usually going to be your best bet as far as how to make progress on a given research problem, whether that's a particular programming language, some environments, um, some physical devices, hardware, robots, things like that. Um, one example I love uh, from pure math is the, the Colatz conjecture. Uh, so this is a, a question of that's very easy to state, but has a deceptively hard answer to pin down. Um, it asks about this function, so f of some natural number n. If it's even, we divide it by 2. If it's odd, multiply it by 3 and add 1. Um, so for instance, if we start with the number 5 and pass it to this function, we first get 16, so we multiply by 3 and add 1. And then if we continue to apply this same function, we end up getting 1, right? 16 is even, so we just go 8, 4, 2, 1. And then one uh, cycles, one to four, four to one, one to four, four to one, and so on. Um, 
So if you visualize the Colatz conjecture, namely if you visualize what happens if you apply all natural numbers um, that we can visualize at least to this function, you end up with these really beautiful spirals that identify the structure of how numbers all move toward one um, as you increase n. And the question of, that the Colatz conjecture is posing, um, it states that this process will eventually reach one no matter what natural number you stick in there. Um, does the question make sense to everyone? Okay, I'm not going to uh, ask you to, to think about the, to solve this one in breakout rooms, um, precisely because this is a, an entirely unanswered question and it's been open for quite a while. Um, and I love the, the mix of how simple it is to state, but how deceptive it is that it's so difficult. So this feels um, almost more like it should be an ant problem in the sense that we do have some kind of plan of attack. Um, but it turns out that after uh, many years of folks working on it, it starts to look more and more like a, a teleportation or an anti-gravity. Um, Paul Erdős, this Hungarian mathematician, said of this problem something to the effect of um, modern mathematics is not ready for the Colatz conjecture. Um, so maybe we should come back when we have the right tools. Um, that being said, I, it could be fun to kind of think about this for a little bit. So I encourage you if you get some time to, to take, a, take a whack at it. Um, beyond the tools that you have around you in terms of identifying a plan of attack, the other most important thing are the collaborators that you have. Um, so leaning on your collaborators and knowing their skill sets, their passions, what gets them fired up and where they're most successful can really point you in the direction of, of a plan of attack. So if you're thinking about a particular question and you have a group um, around you that's well suited to that question, that's a really good mix. But you always want to be mindful of how do my uh, tools and my collaborators kind of gel with this, this question that we're working on um, in terms of this, this plan of attack. And I'll come back a little bit more to say to more about the process of collaboration later. Um, a really natural one is, is knowledge and skills. So of course, um, there's, this, there's a view that you can just try and keep learning stuff forever, and that, that's a great view. Um, but in terms of picking a, a research question in the present, it's important that it's at least close to your wheelhouse in terms of knowledge and skills. I think it's it's useful to study questions that push you outside that zone because then you are encouraged to learn new things in the context of a, of a research project. But it's, um, it's maybe a bold choice to pick a project that's totally outside your comfort zone and forcing you to feel almost stranded in a sense. Um, that being said, if you have collaborators around you that can help you uh, digest and learn that new material, that can be really powerful. Um, I'll just pause there for a moment. Are there any questions or thoughts on this so far? Okay, great. So we will press forward. So the final portion of how to assess whether you have a plan of attack is to inspect the question itself, kind of independent of the tools around you, the people you're working with, the nature of the question itself can also often reveal um, how, how much like an ant question or a teleportation question this can be. And to address this, I, I want to turn to this piece by Uri Allen called How to Choose a Good Scientific Problem. This is a great paper. It's, it's quite quick. Um, and my favorite part is this plot, uh, this pair of plots, really. On the x-axis is a cartoonish version of the difficulty of the problem. And on the y-axis, it's a, a measure of the gain in knowledge, the magnitude of the gain in knowledge. With the, so large gain is, is higher on the y-axis. And it, in this diagram, um, on the right one in particular, you see this Pareto frontier where um, Uri suggests that early on in your research career, you should start with easy problems that yield small gains in knowledge and then slowly walk your way up until you're tackling those really hard but really high gain uh, questions. And I think it's important to take a step back when you're choosing a research problem and try and think for yourself, where does it lie along this curve? Um, in a sense, there's a disadvantage to picking things inside this curve because it's maybe too hard for the amount of knowledge you're gaining and you might be able to make it a little bit easier but still gain the same amount of knowledge in the end. Um, one note that I uh, particularly like in, that's in this ballpark is if you're thinking about a yes or no question, that is um, a question whose answer is definitively yes or definitively no, it is most interesting if that question is, no matter how it's answered, ends up providing a large amount of knowledge. 
That is, it's, it's bad to wager on a yes or no question only being yes. It's only interesting if the answer is yes, um, because then you're setting yourself up for an expectation half the time um, you get no knowledge effectively. So it's really valuable to think about yes or no questions that yield um, huge amounts of knowledge, no matter which direction it comes from. That's usually the sign of a, of a great question, in my opinion. Um, one way I like to think about this notion of, well, how do I know if the question itself is a good question to ask in thinking about research is to visualize the process of working on a, a particular question. So, so say we pick some question, uh, visualize here as this little star, and we think about the trajectory that that might take us on in working on this problem for a little while, um, whether that's the ant question or, or something else that, that maybe you're excited about as working, uh, working on as part of the class. And inevitably, as with, I think every research project I've been in, involved with, there's going to be a roadblock at some point, some day where you realize, I'm not quite sure I know what to do, or the results don't look quite like I thought they would, and I don't know how to explain them, or my data doesn't have something that I needed my data to have, whatever it might be, um, you'll hit these roadblocks. And I think the crucial thing for me, I, I hang on to this, this visual kind of all the time in my research, is to have alternate courses of actions available to you. Um, and in particular, I, I carry around this visual of a sort of light cone around the possible futures a question could lead me down to suggest that no matter what happens, you wanna have a lot of different routes forward for yourself. Ways you can change the question a little bit. You can identify, um, a, maybe relax your, uh, your objectives or maybe change your model or pick a new data set, whatever it might be, you wanna have those, those knobs you can uh, turn to help you be resilient to different roadblocks. Um, so to summarize, I think it's really important in picking a question to ask yourself, if this doesn't work, what else can I do? Um, we saw this in the ant problem, um, that there were these few other ways we could think about things, focusing on a different number of ants, maybe providing an upper bound, maybe changing the length of the log, the speed of the ant, whatever it might be. There's other ways we can try and get, get around solving this problem. Um, so I'll just pause there for a moment again. Any, any other questions or thoughts so far? Um, these, are, these are really helpful points. Um, they're all kind of abstract so far. Do you have examples um, either later or from your personal research that of, of, of bad questions that you've asked? Hmm. Oh, I love that question. Um, let's see, I don't go into too much that's concrete as far as what, what a bad question might look like. Um, one thing I would say is if building off of this comment and then the comment I made previously about yes or no questions being interesting in both directions, um, if a question needs a lot of things to work out a very particular way in order to yield interesting results, that's usually a sign that it, it's, you need to change things a little bit. Um, precisely because of this kind of light cone perspective that you want, you don't know what's going to happen by, by the nature of research. And so allowing yourself to fail, allowing the experiments to kind of lead you in different directions or the theory to lead you in different directions, I think is really important. Um, one other piece I will mention that's maybe a little bit more concrete is from uh, Jason Eisner. He has this nice post, post how to find research problems. Um, and he gives some, I would say, more concrete advice as far as what do, he has this nice distinction between, he calls them like small, I forget the exact, small game and big game projects or something like that. And he walks through some examples of what kinds of small game projects there are versus big game projects. So small would be things like taking an existing project and re-implementing it just doing exactly what someone else did and just convincing yourself of their results. Um, and so that, that might be a place where I direct you for something slightly more concrete because I, I do not go too concrete in this, in this talk yet. Yeah, and to, to chime in uh, to Justin's question, a bad question could be, can we get state-of-the-art by applying a certain type of model to it? Like the results could be useful and it might like, yeah, the community might care to know that, oh, you can push a state-of-the-art by it half of an F1 point, um, but it's most likely the case that the impact won't be too significant. And it's and when chasing state-of-the-art results, it's often the case that you won't get, the default is to fail, right? State-of-the-art is only the best of the best. So the default is probably to not have the best of the best. 
but way more interesting questions could be if I leverage a certain piece of data or approach the problem in a completely different way and incorporate different types of information, could this be useful? Or diagnosing the current state of the art system, what works, what doesn't work with it, try to break it, try to poke holes into what it currently does and understand better the existing work. So instead of just, hey, high numbers, it's, yeah, you get the point. Um, those are way more interesting questions. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, that, that all definitely really resonates with me too, I think. Um, focusing on things that clarify and give give new understanding rather than just numbers that kind of are, are higher than, than existing ones, I think tends to be the kind of work that um, really leads to just new insights, new ways of thinking, that kind of thing. Um, it's a great question though. It makes me want to try and form some kind of taxonomy of different kinds of research questions or something like that. Um, I wanted to make sure I mentioned on uh, from Eisner. This is a great piece. Again, it's it's more contemporary than the Hamming piece, and so I would encourage folks to take a look at this as well. It's quite quick. This you can read in maybe two to five minutes or so. Um, one of piece that I personally really like. Um, I, I like all of this advice, and and I think I take this broader question uh, suggested by Eisner here to to indicate, in addition to just caring about the research, you should also care about how that research kind of fits into your, your life and your goals and your broader uh, trajectory. And so it might just be a fun project. It might allow you to collaborate with a friend. It might allow you to participate in a new community, whatever that might be. So there are a lot of ways you can kind of structure your goals. And one that I, I really like is a project that kind of opens doors to new, kind, new projects, even if that one itself wasn't that uh, enticing. Um, uh, David, before you get too far into this, uh, Marcel had a yeah, question. Totally. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, so it was just kind of a, as a follow on to that, I guess that idea of a good question. And I think something that I found really interesting is almost how the question frames the answer and perhaps mm. how the question almost gives insight into the answer as well. So even with the ant question, because you changed it from pass through, uh, sorry, from colliding to pass through, that changed the whole approach. And uh, we even in this class learned about uh, a different one where they were trying to optimize the taste of a crisp, but they framed it as an engineering question. And in doing so, it actually led to an answer. So I think that's a, a really interesting thing as well when, when framing it. Mm, I love that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's such a great insight that like the, the question sort of points to different kinds of answers. Absolutely. And so it's um, you, you might kind of develop a taste over time of like what what kinds of answers am I sort of pointing to with this flavor of question? And like like Chris mentioned, this this notion of can I beat state of the art? That's pointing toward a particular kind of answer of I need a new thing that I can run on these benchmarks and beat these other things. Um, yeah, so I, I really appreciate that point, Marcel. Thank you. Uh, any any other questions or comments here before moving forward? All right. Uh, so I was just going to briefly mention that I one aspect of a project that I, I really like is if it itself, you don't find the results to be that powerful or impactful, but um, it, you know as it sits on on human knowledge, this big blue box that clearly doesn't exist, but it's you know there's something like this out there, Wikipedia, etc. Um, your your work, your research is adding something new to that that mix, and it might be that that new thing is is really small or it's it doesn't quite go in the direction you thought it would, but it might be this, this key uh, bridge that allows you to then go and study some new and epic thing. Um, and one way to think about this is what questions do I need to answer before I'm ready to confront this big, massive question on the horizon? Um, and in many ways that can guide what a good question is because it's setting you up to be successful later. And so if you think about something, even like these teleportation anti-gravity kinds of things, what would we need to know before we could get to those? That can define what a good question is too, because it's opening future doors. Um, so I really like that perspective on what a good question is as well. Um, so the insights here th that I wanted to leave you all with is that the, maybe the main thing I would, I would leave you with is try to find questions that have a plan of attack, where that plan of attack can come from how the question is framed, what your skills, knowledge, and tools are, and who your collaborators are. Um, that mixture is really going to expose plans of attack and that you should always make sure you have some, even just gut feeling about being able to turn something into a, an attackable question. Uh, the other piece that I really like in this space is this, this light cone visual of 
uh, imagining questions that have a lot of adaptation built into them that you're able to move in a lot of di different directions and pivot a little bit as needed because research just doesn't go as planned. I don't think I've ever had a project where I sat down and said, I'm going to do this, I did it, and then I published it. There's just, there's a lot of uh, winding roads uh, along the way um, that allow, so you should allow yourself to kind of be surprised by, by the work. Um, the other piece that I'm, I'm quite fond of in this space is this notion that yes or no questions themselves can be, um, should be interesting in both directions. If you're setting yourself up for only one of those directions to be interesting, it's usually the sign that you should, should maybe change questions. Not always, of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but um, any, any thoughts here before moving on? All right. So next up, I, I wanted to tell you a little story about uh, Ptolemy. Maybe you've seen this before, some folks. Um, so Ptolemy was this uh, ancient Rome uh, astronomer. Uh, he was around in 100 AD or so. He was just looking up at the stars and trying to track their movements. Um, and at some point, he released this thing called the Amalgus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, the Amalgus summarized his findings. So this, he did some research. He published this thing that contained um, a model of the solar system. Um, this model is pictured roughly uh, in this top right corner. This is a geocentric model of the solar system where the earth is at the center and then there's all these crazy squiggly lines around the outside. Um, have folks seen this before? Has anyone seen this example? This is one of my favorite examples of kind of the history of, of science. Um, so this model that Ptolemy came up with uh, was incredibly accurate at predicting the movements of the celestial bodies, so planets and, and uh, their moons and things like that. And the way it worked is uh, Ptolemy assumed or theorized that the Earth was at the center of the solar system and that everything was revolving around the Earth. And as soon as a prediction was wrong, uh, things were moving around the Earth in a typical orbit, in a circular orbit. And as soon as a prediction was wrong, Ptolemy said, ah, but we can add an epicycle where a planet will, or a body, will also be moving in circles as it orbits the Earth. And if it was wrong again, they would just add a, yet another epicycle. So it adds another parameter to the model that allows it to ultimately explain basically any, uh, any observed data. Um, this model was around for about 1400 years. That's a, a crazy amount of time. Um, and was, to the best of my knowledge, uh, perceived as being kind of the, the most accurate model uh, during that time period. Um, Copernicus, Copernicus comes along in the 1500s and proposes this heliocentric model that, as you can see, is uh, quite a bit simpler than the one that we still enjoy today. Um, but even in the 1500s, the Ptolemy model was still quite accurate. Um, and the reason I tell this story, there's, there's a lot to take away from, from uh, this story to me, uh, one of which is this question of how do we decide between different uh, models? That's kind of a whole separate endeavor. But, but to me, this is a story of, of research and progress. And to me, I, I like orienting myself toward this kind of broad story about the, the kind of growth of human knowledge over time. That we, before we had this geocentric model, then some heliocentric model, then we get this, this picture of the earth from um, miles and miles and hundreds and thousands of miles away from the Voyager in the 90s. And then most recently, you know, we land yet another rover um, on Mars and we get a video of, of the rover. Um, and it, it raises this question to me of what questions do future generations need answers to? Um, so how to think about research, to me, it's trying to confront that question. What do we wanna go out and think about that would help future generations kind of understand the world better? Um, and to me, it also emphasizes the fact that we have to build on the existing work. Copernicus had to, to go off and read uh, Ptolemy's Amalgus. He had to do his, his proper lit review, right? Um, and so I'd, I'd encourage you all to think about what are you curious about and, and how does it fit into that landscape of what questions do future generations need answers to? Um, and then building off of this insight from before, how might you form this plan of attack? <clears throat> all right, so any questions or thoughts on that before we press forward? I'll add some, some comments. Um, for people who are new to research, it can often be the case that uh, we get super excited and we're overly ambitious and we try stuff that is um, the scope of which is just like it's too difficult. Um, and it's often easy to just 
overlook the related works, just like what David said. Um, so all this is, I'm not by any means trying to say, students in this class aim lower, try smaller things. I'm just letting you know that, um, in fact, in some ways this could be viewed as um, like more encouraging to realize that most things that get published is so incremental. Like the things that eventually accumulate and, and become our new scientific understanding of, of our world. Well, in order to get there, it really is just so incremental, right? For transformers, this incredibly powerful architecture to exist. It built upon tons of background. In fact, people have been doing neural nets for 50, 60 years. Um, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, but with this class, it's kind of one of, it's kind of a unique opportunity to be more ambitious than what you typically would, which I've said before, right? As soon as you're done with school, assuming you're not going to do more school, you're going to join some organization, you're getting a paycheck and you're expected to be grounded in some level of expected results. So although most things are pretty incremental and you should definitely not, uh, be ridiculous in your scope. This course is a, is a chance to be pretty bold and creative with certain techniques. By no means should you guys all place your eggs in one basket of one technique working, um, but it's worth keeping all this in mind. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Chris. That, that's uh, great additional insights as well. I think um, one thing that my little timeline here is missing is the probably hundreds of thousands of additional insights that led to each of these transitions. and. Um, yeah, I just know that this Eureka was, moments are, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. I just know that for me, I was, I came up about it, like with, with that approach, usually when I was first getting started with research, it was like, Oh, well, what if I just come up with a completely different architecture? It's like, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's not going to work out. That's not how things work. Um, pay more attention to what people have actually done, address smaller things, fix that, make that better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe one, one, uh, type of project that can enter this kind of taxonomy of research projects coming back to, I think it was Justin's question, um, is taking an existing framework or model or theory or algorithm and just identifying failure modes of it. Saying here's a case where this thing really doesn't work and here's why. I was actually um, just chatting with some folks about a paper from 2019 and that paper, the purpose of it was to say, here's this common approach and it doesn't work in this context and that's the paper. And that, that is a, a very helpful, useful thing to do. And there's there's always more approaches to try and identify failure modes. So I think that that is a, at least one kind of concrete way to, to build. Um, excellent. So I will press forward. I Maybe Chris, should I check in on the time? Um, yeah, you're good on time. Doing? Basically, okay. um, we have three hours for this block. Um, but okay. most, guest most guest lectures are 45 to 70 minutes. Um, okay. But take Perfect. as much time as you need. Okay. Excellent. I'll check in once I finish the part two, I guess, and see if I'm still doing okay. They should be about the same length. Cool. All right. So next up, once we have our question in hand, and I, I say question, there are other ways to frame research in terms of problems and engineering efforts and things like that. Um, I use question kind of as part of this story, but um, you could think of answer as kind of implementation as well in addition to uh, addressing the question directly. Um, the answer is a lot of the meat of research in a sense. Once you've got your question, now you're on the ground with your collaborators, you're trying to make progress. What does that look like? It's hard and it's going to vary depending on the, the question and the nature of what you're doing. But I thought I would offer just a few insights that might be helpful in thinking about how to answer questions. And the first of which is to really think about our tools uh, that we make use of regularly. And so I emphasized the purpose of tools and the role of tools earlier on. Um, so here we have this Australopithecus from 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, this famous scene right, like, that makes use of this tool to do things that the, the Australopithecus couldn't without the, the tool. Um, and on the right, I'm showing these stone axes that were found that are evidence that our ancient ancestors started to enhance their own tools. That is, they, they started to refine their tools so their tools would do more for them. And I really like this, this uh, this little aphorism, this notion of sharpening our tools so, so as to make uh, make them more effective for us. And we can really apply this to kind of the contemporary world too, uh, to make sure that over time we're bringing in tools and making use of them that, that help us uh, on a regular basis. Um, so just one example of this, um, as Chris mentioned, I, I work in reinforcement learning and during my PhD at Brown, I spent a lot of time running the same kinds of experiments in slightly different settings. And so at some point I just 
put everything on hold and I wrote a little Python library that made that kind of experiment very easy to run. Um, so I'll just show you a quick example of this because um, this really simplified a lot of uh, research for me. So here I'm just opening up a little terminal, um, running a little script. This creates some learning algorithms. It creates the learning uh, environment, simulates the process of them learning, tracks the data, and then produces the plot. Um, and I, I did this in part because I found myself redoing this process a lot. I found myself fidgeting with matplotlib and plotting uh, tools quite a lot. And I didn't like it. And I found I would always screw it up. And so I just did it right once so that I didn't have to do it wrong more times later. Um, I made use of this tool all the time. Um, I think almost every paper I published from 2016 to 2020 uh, during my time at Brown, I, I used this, this set of scripts. Maybe without any exception, I'm not quite sure. But I used it very regularly and continued to refine it over time to, to make uh, good use of it for, for the, what I needed to do. And so think about for yourself, like what kinds of tools you might use or you might need um, during your project. And it might be worth just spending like an hour or an afternoon, just making sure that you really have a good understanding of what that tool can do and making sure that you don't, you're not gonna repeat a bunch of work over time. Um, speaking of, um, one thing you'll do very regularly uh, in building on existing literature is reading papers. Um, so of course, the, the white paper is this way to disseminate knowledge and to, to kind of share it with the community. And so reading papers is an activity that you do quite a lot as, as a researcher and in trying to, to do your own research. Um, but no one tells you how to read a research paper, um, except maybe uh, Keshav here in this paper, how to read a paper. Um, so this paper is quite short. Uh, I, I also encourage taking a look at this. I do include a link, by the way, that to a list of materials that references all of the different um, articles that I'm, I'm mentioning throughout the talk. Um, in this paper, Keshav suggests doing three passes of any paper you read. In the first pass, I think it's something like read the abstract and maybe the conclusion, and that's it. It takes 20 seconds <clears throat> or a minute, whatever it might be. Then in the second pass, you can start to dig in a little bit more. You read the intro and maybe the main result. Third pass, you do the whole thing. Um, but I love this, not because you necessarily need to do exactly this, but because it suggests the power is in your hands to figure out how best to make use of these resources that are out there. And so you can figure out a scheme for yourself. It's worth maybe taking a step back and thinking, how should I be reading papers? Um, in a seminar I took at Brown, actually, we spent some time looking at how to read our really mathy papers. Um, and one uh, takeaway I wanted to share you with, with you all from this um, was how to look at a big scary theorem like this one. Um, so this is actually from, uh, this is a great paper it's from Estrella et al. 2008. Here's one of the main results and it's just a bunch of math. And it's a, it, when you look at it, it just, it doesn't really evoke this sense of cool. I, I get what's going on here. Um, unless you've really been in this area, you really uh, dig into the details. And so what I wanted to suggest was if you find yourself reading papers as part of this class or, or otherwise, the, the technique that I was taught was Basically ignore all this stuff, um, focus on whatever the main chunk is, and even then try to simplify it to so make a cartoonish version of it. So for instance, this first term on the left, this fraction, the top is some set. The set is being constructed by elements of this thing S and this thing A. Cool, let's ignore the rest and just call this size of S, size of A. Um, then the rest of this, there's some logs. Cool, let's ignore it and just call it log stuff. Now we have this nice term s squared a, v max cubed. Um, we might even be able to get rid of v max, depending on what we want to do. And so now when you think about this theorem in this paper, you can make use of that kind of cartoonish version without you needing to know all these little details. So I think it's useful to identify those little shortcuts um, as you're reading a paper. Uh, so any questions about paper reading, anything like that before I go on? This is more of a thought. Um, it this reminded me of your previous point, which was kind of like invest in tooling, where often I think of like abstractions as tools of thought. And this mm -hmm. seems like just abstract a bunch of stuff as tools for thinking about it. So you get rid of all the details. I just wanted to make that connection. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. I, I love that point. And my uh, my thesis work was on abstraction. So I'm, I'm very fun. You can probably tell since I'm talking about very abstract things rather than detailed things. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely really appreciate that point. And finding the right abstractions to use for yourself um, as you do research, I think is really valuable. Yeah, so thanks. That's a great point. Any other comments or questions so far? To add to David's point about um, the good advice of uh, reading a paper in three passes, why that is such great advice is because it's often the case that the paper could not be, maybe it's not relevant to you at all. And you don't know that until you go pretty wide. So it's, you know, there's always this dance between breadth first and depth first. So when you're first starting out, especially, that's when it's really crucial to give a lot of papers first passes that you otherwise would just be wasting your time by reading with a lot of depth. Um, and inevitably, pretty much for any paper one reads, it's almost impossible to get 100% understanding of what they did. Because oftentimes, there are some details that are just left out. For most conferences, uh, you only have eight pages. So they're not going to be able to go down to, to the level of explaining every single different hyperparameter. I mean, we're working on this. Everybody tries to get better and better of allowing for reproducible experiments. Um, but there's always going to be something that's just probably impossible to, to figure out. Um, so my point of saying all this, that you could spin your wheels quite a bit. If for every single paper that it's like, oh, this title looks cool. Let me just read it. Like it's, it's easy to fall in kind of the, the typical trap of like, hey, well, I'm a good student. I can read this. I can, you know, go through 20 papers, but it's not the most optimal technique often, especially when you're first starting out. Focus on breadth, do a whole bunch of first passes. And only when you think it's necessary is it worth doing a second and third pass. Definitely. Yeah, that's great advice. Thanks, Chris. Excellent. So next up, I was just going to uh, make a few comments about the process of collaboration. Um, in my view, there's roughly two modes of collaboration. One is if you are actively leading the project and people are looking to you for direction and for allocation of work and that sort of thing. The other is the kind of maybe more typical mode where there's a group of people, you're working on some stuff together, either someone else is leading or you're a contributor as part of that larger project. And I just wanted to first emphasize, and this is maybe one of my, my I think, biggest lessons for myself uh, over the years, is that research is a profoundly social process. Um, again, there's, there's maybe some researchers that spend most of their time uh, working on their own. I can say most of my best work has been with, with groups of people. I have learned massively from working with folks. Basically, every collaborator you work with, you learn their favorite lessons of how to do research, their favorite tricks and tools, how to write, how to read, what their favorite uh, re results are, that, that sort of thing. And so the social nature of research, I think, is, is so fundamentally important, and it's important to not overlook it. And so that means a couple things pragmatically. One is, if you have a meeting with people and people don't know each other, have them all introduce, get introduced first. Um, make it fun and have people feel at ease and confident and willing to share their ideas. Because there's this sense of vulnerability too, where maybe you don't want to share that you have some, you know, wild thing you're thinking about and you don't want people to shoot it down and say, oh, you, you should have read, you know, this classic paper from um, Simpson et al, you know, 2010, that they did this and showed it was a bad idea or something. So creating an environment where people feel confident and respected and, and willing to share and discuss is so deeply important. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that, but I think just being aware and mindful of the social nature of research is really important. Um, I also really want to emphasize the, the profound importance of diverse perspectives. Um, so there's this sense in which a group of collaborators act as a filter on, on one another's work and ideas and that sort of thing, in the sense that you do work over time and the end product will have gone through everyone's filter. So whatever people think are good ideas will survive um, with a lot of different diverse perspectives. And so there's, there's a lot of ways in which this works. First is, is this notion of good ideas kind of passing everyone's filter. So as a, re as a result, inevitably, the best ideas will, will leave these kind of diverse uh, groups. But also, the skills and tools are going to be so much more uh, powerful when you work with folks from a lot of different uh, mindsets. Um, I've had the, this amazing pleasure of working with a cognitive scientist for the past few years, and he's just taught me a huge amount about how to think about, about research and, and how to conduct experiments and that sort of thing that 
um, if I was working with someone that's identical to me as a, as a reinforcement learning researcher, maybe I wouldn't have learned those lessons. And so I think it's always valuable to try and bridge that disciplinary gap um, and bring in folks from uh, all sorts of departments and backgrounds and that sort of thing. Um, if you are in the position to allocate tasks, um, I think it's useful to, to figure out who should take what based on primarily passion and then maybe to a lesser extent skill. But to me, research is a lot about passion and just where people's curiosity takes them. And so I think figuring out what to work on is mostly a, a passion matching problem. Uh, the fourth piece I want to mention here is that just the process of talking about ideas, even ones that are underdeveloped, is incredibly powerful. Um, that's how you refine them over time, figuring out how to share. So if you talk to maybe a friend, you talk to um, a sibling, you talk to a, a lab mate, sharing that same idea to those different audiences is gonna force you to think about the different ways in which that idea fits into these different kinds of like thoughtscapes. And so I think the practice of talking about ideas um, and other people's ideas is really powerful as well. And then just to say uh, a few words on the process of contributing, I think a lot of the things in this first category also apply to the case where you're a contributor. Um, in big projects, when you're, you're contributing to something, it's important to just find that niche that really feels like the, the kind of philosophy of the project and the direction and the, the skills you bring to the table really fit. Um, and so searching for that feeling where you feel like you have you've found the way that your skills kind of fit well into the project is really important. Um, a classic adage that I think everyone has a favorite version of this, but learning when to say no, don't get too spread too thin, that sort of thing. This is a really hard problem, but it's, it's super important to learn to say no. You should be saying no to some stuff at some point. Um, and it's hard to figure out what, but it's, it's of course just mostly just a personal thing. Um, any questions or comments here? All right, we'll press forward. Um, another thing that tends to happen in answering research questions is getting stuck. Um, so inevitably, I, I'm, these roadblocks occur. I drew this picture before with, with a single roadblock, but really the visual is something more like this, or perhaps even more X's. Um, and so really your path is gonna look more like this. There's these winding paths as you dodge left and right from all these different roadblocks. Um, and really what I'm saying is that I think it's, it is uh, I'm re emphasizing that you can go back to the drawing board and try and broaden your question um, as you continue to get stuck. Rather than think the only way forward is to just beat down this roadblock and solve this really hard problem, you can always reframe your objectives, reframe your question, broaden your horizon a little bit. That's another move you have available um, rather than just like blasting forward. Um, I've had a number of projects that I felt the only way forward was just to keep working on the model that I had proposed and I actually, in one case, I left a project aside for about a year, came back to it with fresh eyes, slightly different uh, change to the model, and then everything clicked and it worked just fine. Um, and it's, still, it's one of my favorite uh, projects. So it's, uh, it'll come up shortly, actually. Um, so uh, the thing to emphasize here, you'll getting stuck with research is inevitable. Um, there's a nice piece from, I think it's an Eisner piece. He says something like a problem if you get stuck on a problem, that means it really has bite and it's like useful that you're solving it because other people might get stuck too. So you, you can kind of go back and you, your research is about helping other people not get stuck on the same problem. Um, great. Um, so one other uh, notion that I think is more broadly useful for kind of your, your future careers. Uh, th this is again, a, a piece that I have really lived by that yeah, I found to be massively important is the notion of treating project commitments like a portfolio and diversifying um, in light of that, that treatment. Um, so if we come back to um, Alan's how to choose a good scientific problem, we can think about the notion of committing to maybe one large high risk, high reward project, and then one easier project, and then maybe one even easier project. So it's important to have this kind of diversity of in terms of risk, but also in terms of the kind of thinking you'll be doing, kinds of maybe experiment, one's experimental, one's theory, one's with this group of collaborators, one's with this group, like all those notions of diversity, I think equip you to um, deal with roadblocks effectively. Um, one way to think about that is to diversify with respect to a project life cycle. So if we start with our question, we, we pick our question, we do some experiments, we do some analysis, and then we're in the process of writing a paper, 
that's a good time to have another project at this maybe earlier phase where we're starting to think about experimentation. Um, and again, I don't take this to be that uh, essential of research, but rather just the, the process of engaging in multiple projects at a time. Um, if you don't diversify in this way, I think there's a lot of cost to switching between the same activity on two separate things. So I, I wrote, I was writing two papers at the same time in 2018 and it was a, it was a nightmare for me. Like I, I had a hard, I had personally had a very hard time doing that. Maybe others won't, but I think the process of trying to do the same activity for two unrelated things, I find personally very challenging and trying to find it valuable to make sure that if you're working on more than one thing, that they are in fact at different stages of the life cycle. Um, right. Okay, so just to summarize this section, um, I think to me the biggest thing is confront and internalize the fact that research is deeply, deeply social, um, work on getting to know people, understand their, their perspectives and really look for understanding um, in general with your collaborators. Um, as we discussed from this, uh, this paper, how to, how to read a paper, you can think actively about how to read and how to kind of sharpen your tools and, and do the things that you do on a daily basis more generally. Um, and then to me, the best uh, trick for avoiding this, this problem of getting stuck is to diversify in a lot of different ways, but it is inevitable, it, it will happen. Um, one other uh, link I really like here, again, I include this in the list at the end, is these nice problem solving tips from 3BlueOneBrown. It's just a fantastic YouTube channel. Okay, so I will pause there. Um, Chris, are we doing okay on time? I've got maybe 10 minutes left. I can yeah, jump to the end good. too if we just want to. No, no, you're good. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'll just pause then. Do, do folks have other questions or thoughts on this so far before I move on to the last part? Okay, let's press forward then. So the way I think about communication is you are now at the, the stage where you've you had your question, you've come up with your answer. Maybe you've done this process of changing the question a little bit, revising the answer a little bit, and now you wanna communicate it to the world. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this. And I think the maybe big picture, the most important thing from this section to me is that this communication process is about both communicating your question what was it and why was it an important question to answer? And it's about communicating your answer. Um, I think a lot of the one failure mode is to focus purely on just conveying your answer uh, in either a presentation or in a paper. Um, you could imagine a presentation where someone just jumps to ta-da and P equals NP or something. And what, what is that? I don't know what that is. You, you really need the, the context. You want to tell the story that leads people through why this question mattered and get them to this answer. Um, so in the contemporary world, I really take there to be four mediums um, that are very important for communication. Um, the first and, and the most kind of iconic to research are the, the classic white paper. There's some efforts right now actually to move away from the white paper, like distill from OpenAI. Um, and there's a nice workshop at iClear this year on rethinking uh, the scientific paper and machine learning to moving to things like blog posts or podcasts or videos or something like that. I think there's a lot to be said about the potential for that. Um, but for now, papers are incredibly important for conveying uh, research findings. You also have things like posters at conferences where you get to share your work. Um, and then of course, uh, presentations and this kind of generic nebulous other category of everything else like blogs and social media and I put an elevator here because to me, the elevator pitch is a particular but very important version of, of research communication as well. Yeah, and by the way, the uh, final deliverables for this class is um, a good bit of the everything else. So we want to diversify and allow the students to get uh, experience with a bunch of different mediums. So a blog post, a final presentation, uh, and then a poster presentation. Um, and then in the meantime, they're, they're doing kind of the more traditional papers, just in a little more relaxed environment. It's a technical document, not necessarily like a polished LaTeX document. Hmm, nice. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I love, I, I'm a big proponent of the, the notion that communication definitely goes beyond like a single document and to these other mediums. I think that that's really powerful because you want to reach uh, different audiences and not, not everyone's going to sit down and read a paper. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's, and yeah, they're, many ways to be effective with it. So one of the successful groups from last semester, 
Well, they have a blog post. It's available on our Capstone website. And some other researchers from MIT saw our blog post and have reached out and say, hey, like, you know, we saw your work. We're doing similar stuff. We would like to, to collaborate type of thing. Um, so all this is to stress David's point that um, published papers are great. We're always attracted towards published papers, um, but you can be effective in many different mediums. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. So today I'm going to spend slightly more time focusing on paper writing. Um, but I'm ha yeah, happy to maybe engage on, on questions and discussion at the end about these other mediums as well. Um, I wanted to just raise the question of like, what, what would it look like for us to try and write a paper about our little ant problem? Um, and to me, the, the way I think about paper writing um, is that it's all about connecting the dots between our question and our answer. Um, that is to say, this introduction and background that typically appears to me is all about contextualizing your reader and what, what was your question and why did it matter? Where did it come from? What other work asked similar questions or why was this an interesting thing to ask? And then your results and discussion is conveying that answer. How did you address it and why was that a satisfying and convincing way to address this answer? Um, the rest of the paper is just the route that gets you between these two things. And to me, the, perhaps the most important piece of this route is to expose this critical insight. Um, one way to view research is that it's, it's a path for other people to follow when they think about the same question you did. And by identifying these insights that helped us think about this problem, so in this case, this equivalence between the bounce and the pass through for the ant, telling other people that as they approach this ant problem, it's giving them a recipe for how to think about this. And that to me is the, is the sign of a really effective way to, to write a paper that is getting, telling a story of how to think about things so that they can appreciate why this answer is true, not just that it is true. Um, an example of this is from my, uh, my advisor's dissertation. He wrote this in uh, 1996. Um, it was one of my favorite first lines of any kind of technical writing uh, is a frog jumps around a barrier to get a delicious mealworm. Uh, so he, he was also, was and is also a reinforcement learning researcher. Um, and he used this little story of a frog um, and a few other examples to describe the importance of the reinforcement learning problem. Um, and so I love this. And I, I bring this particular instance up because it conveys the, the sense in which there, I mean, there are rules, right, about how to write papers and everything, but you can be fun and, and creative and, and just do things that will work to bring your reader in and help them kind of understand the material. Um, and when I, when I just draw this kind of abstract diagram of moving from the question to the answer, I, I mean that in, in a, a pragmatic sense that it's like, it can be useful to follow this kind of recipe, but I also mean that I, in the sense that I've, I've done this. So this is a paper I wrote previously. This is the one I talked about that I, I struggled with for a little while and then ultimately uh, found a way around it. This is from the intro of the paper. Um, you see, uh, Justin, there's abstraction right in the, in the question. Um, so the question is italicized on the first page, and then the answer is on page six or something like that. Um, so the question is here, the answer is here, and then everything else in this paper is just, why did this question matter? What other people have tried to answer this? And then what details do you need in order to appreciate why this answer addresses this question? And so this is typically how I write papers now. Um, not all the time, of course, um, but this is, uh, I think the most recent thing that I wrote um, this was from 2020 back when I was at Brown. And it's, uh, yeah, this, this is a template of, of how I think about paper writing. And one way to approach this is to really, again, ask yourself this question of, if I tried to convey why these two pieces, why does this question matter? Why does this answer matter to different audiences? It's gonna put you in the mindset of what do they need to know in order to appreciate why this, this question I was all excited about ended up mattering. Um, one, uh, <laughs> one image I came across recently um, from the research community um, was a, it was called how to be more impressive. That is in a sentence, like telling us not to overcomplicate things. Let's, let's be as simple as possible. So it's quite fuzzy for me and I actually can't read it super well, but the premise is at the top, um, we want to pump, publish something like one plus one equals two but this isn't impressive. Um, so let's make it more complicated by just adding a bunch of stuff until we end up with a nice 
more complicated thing at the bottom um, that it, it, it's incre it hides the answer. Um, so I draw this arrow here to suggest that, again, from, the, from this ant perspective, the idea is to reveal the answer. We want to get people to understand why things were true. And so we should really be moving up this, uh, it, yeah, we should be moving up in this kind of process rather than down. We should be trying to simplify and clarify as best as possible, not hiding things. Um, so coming back to this idea of how do you, how might you convince um, your peers, your colleagues, teachers, mentors, and so on about the significance of these things. And by first clarifying that can do uh, a, a lot of the work um, by really emphasizing clarity and simplicity. Okay, so with that, I will uh, just summarize this section. So I take there to be these four mediums as we discussed with the fourth being this kind of big broad other bucket that's also quite important. Um, I personally view paper writing as all about clarity and trying to tell the story that tells people why did this thing matter and how could you look at it so that you don't need to go down all these other paths that I led down that ended up being full of roadblocks. Um, one way to literally start the, the writing process is just put your question down, put your answer down, and then build around those two things. And I've done that quite a lot in the past myself. Um, and with that, I will conclude. Yeah, so thanks a ton, everybody. This, this was a lot of fun. Um, this link has uh, like a list of those materials that I referenced and a few other ones that I, I didn't uh, end up including, but I, I also find them quite helpful. And with that, I'll go to some additional questions or comments if you have any. So thanks again. Yeah, so before questions, thanks so much, David. This was great advice. This was brilliant. I, uh, it was hard for me to not interrupt because I want to be like, yes, exactly that. <laughs> or, oh, I wish I knew that when I started my PhD. Uh, and I have examples of, I mean, true examples for my own stuff, my own research over the past 10 years that um, coincide exactly with what David's saying. It's like, yep, had I done this, well, that would have been, or maybe like we should have focused on this instead, or yes, research is more social than what I once knew like 10 years ago. Um, so a lot of great points. So thanks so much for being here. I'm excited to see uh, what questions students have. Awesome, thanks Chris. I'd like to chime in real quick. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. It was really useful for understanding research. I wanna go back to the Ptolemy model um, and I thought that was really interesting where I feel like ML right now is in the height of geocentrism. And in that aspect, I wanted to ask about this idea of incrementalism where I feel like a lot of, you know, people like us who want to get into the field, but aspire to Copernicus might dream big and, you know, write these new models and come up with crazy ideas. But inevitably as research progresses and you slowly start to slide down that Pareto curve, of, oh, I'm going to compromise and work on these easier problems or more tractable problems. How important do you think it is for people to perhaps parallelize and think about ways to increase our alpha as a field as a whole? Incrementalism can be almost thought of as having a really small granular alpha on the learning curve of the entirety of the academic field. I'm just wondering about your thoughts in that area. Yeah, wow. This is, this is an amazing question. I love this. Um, you yeah, have a lot of really good points there. So let's see. I think doing the Copernicus move of these kind of big paradigm shifts is of course very difficult. And no, knowing that you're doing the right thing can be very challenging. Um, and so I think it's, but it is important if you, if you have a feeling that that's the direction things need to go, um, I do think it's important to probably push in that direction a little bit. So. Yeah, let me, let me, okay, concretely, let me say, maybe say a few things. It is, I think, profoundly more difficult to not operate within the tools and models and ideas that the community is already operating in. If you do something within the, within the field, within the confines of what people consider as like the right way to think about things, um, those results are more likely to get co-opted and, and accepted and, and built on and that sort of thing. Um, coming along and, and uh, you know, turning the, the, the geocentric model into a heliocentric model, I think is, of course, it's radically more difficult. Um, and so I, I think for myself, if I, if I wanted to sit down and say, I want to do the heliocentrism of, of ML, um, I think what I would recommend is maintain two lines of work, one of which is a 
more traditional in the confines of the field um, so that you, you know those models and those theories and where those things fail. And then the other is this more experimental, like basically coming back to this diversification point, um, try and put, maybe push in both directions. That's, that's one route you could take. Um, another is to try and go this direction of uh, coming back taxonomy of research projects that I mentioned before. One, one kind of project you could study is, one, pro one project you could do is just show a fundamental shortcoming in, an, in the existing framework that kind of gives rise to what you think this other uh, alternate model needs to be, this alternate paradigm perspective. Um, that way you're operating within the rules of the field, but opening the door to this other, um, this other area. But I have to say though, I, I myself, I, don't, I would never claim that my, my work has been this kind of radical paradigm shifting stuff, the this, this stuff I published. So I, I don't think there's a magical recipe for it. Um, but I, I will say it's, it is definitely worth keeping that dream alive of like thinking how to, how to do these, these sorts of paradigm shifts, because if we all agree to the existing paradigm, I think it, it has this forcing function and we lose out on those other ways of thinking about things. Um, yeah, it's a great question though. I don't know if I have too much more to say. Maybe one, one final thing would be just to look in the history of the field. So going back to um, some of these earlier papers where they didn't know what this paradigm was gonna look like and they were wrestling with these questions. What caused those historians, I mean, sorry, not historians, those historical figures to lead us toward the paradigm that we have now um, rather than go these other directions. Um, so there's this line of work on thinking about AI kind of going back to this 1956 uh, Dartmouth conference um, that I think is really worth kind of familiarizing yourself with if you wanted to do this sort of paradigm shifting uh, work. There's a really nice paper from Rod Brooks. Um, there's a, a lot of nice papers from Rod Brooks, but there's one called um, Intelligence Without Representation that has a kind of nice paradigm shifting feel to it. It, it sort of picks on abstraction a little bit, um, that, that's one. So that, but independent of AI to, to address the more general question, if you wanted to do paradigm shifting work, one place you might get inspiration is by looking at the early line of inquiry that gave rise to that paradigm. But again, love the question and I, I don't have a magic recipe, unfortunately, yeah. Any Thank other kind so of follow-ups that. to that? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that was really helpful. And I just love to see this conversation continued and especially the field somehow reifying these ideas in their incremental approach. And as mm -hmm. you say, to keep these, uh, these ideas in mind and in particular finding the incremental approaches in aggregating our own knowledge approaches, which would be really fun. But thanks again, mm -hmm. it was really helpful. Yeah, and then this, no is, uh, this is pretty much what, what David was saying also, but uh, I wanna make clear that like when I said a lot of stuff is incremental, by no means am I saying we should not um, aim for ambitious, big, radically different things. I'm just saying that ultimately it needs to be distilled. Like when you're trying to solve it at some level, you need to distill it down to smaller incremental stuff, both in terms of your approach to get to the big thing, but then also in terms of the acceptance within the community. Um, so it's okay to go big and to have outlandish pursuits. Um, but at some point in order to get there, it needs to be grounded often in very incremental steps. Um, yeah, I mean, I can give real examples of this. One of my good friends is a, a researcher in a different department doing um, ancient Near Eastern language stuff and uh, has taken statistical approaches within that, whereas the community generally has not taken statistical approaches and have approached things in a very humanity language driven way of just understanding deeply historical texts from BC, 1000 BC and stuff. So doing like the very advanced statistical approaches that, that uh, he's tried have had great success, but it was very hard for his work to, to get accepted uh, within his field. Um, yeah, and there was this, uh, this kind of wild example in pure math. I don't, I don't understand the results at all, but there's this conjecture called the ABC conjecture. And there was this mathematician, I think in Australia that spent like 10 years working on it and then announced to the public that they had solved the ABC conjecture and like introduced all this new fancy stuff to make it happen. And people said, 
we, we literally can't understand this. And they came out with like a 500 page manuscripts said, yeah, it's, it's all in there. It's all in the details. <laughs> and I think as far as I know, the last I heard people were still digging through this manuscript to see if uh, the thing was true or not. Um, yeah, so that all that to say, there's, there's a lot of advantage to kind of regular uh, engagement with the community. Um, one other, I guess, comment that I, I, I had upon more reflection was that there are venues Part of the thing here is, is the incentive structure of research, right? Like publishing a paper at a, at a conference in computer science or at journals more generally, um, reviewers expect particular things. Um, hopefully that's, that's doing good research and, and everything. Um, but given that there's this bar of what constitutes a publishable piece of work, it usually means operating within the confines of the field, not always. Um, but if you have kind of riskier work, there are avenues for this. So to me, there's there's these venues of workshops that accompany conferences that usually allow for more exploratory or experimental work. And so one, th one way to kind of maybe get started with, uh, if you wanna do radical paradigm shifting stuff is to write up, do, do some work that could be communicated at a workshop where you can get that feedback early on in the, in the project's phase rather than trying to publish a thing that just tries to redefine everything um, years down the line. So I, th I have found workshops to be sources of uh, places to rethink things. So I, I do like, like those venues quite a lot. Um, they're, they're going on virtually, of course, and then, you know, fingers crossed when the world uh, can heal a little bit, we'll, we'll have workshops in, in person again. But anyway, um, any uh, other Paulina, questions? Or, yeah, uh, Paulina has her hand raised. Yeah. Um, so my question is kind of about something that feels like it's been a little understated or kind of like hidden in plain sight, which is in order to like do a lot of these things, you have to have like a level of confidence in your skill and, and comfort in the field. And I was wondering if at any moment, like as a PhD student or even like in your, like within industry, if you ever felt like in choosing a question or like, you know, choosing a particular methodology that you were, that you had to like convince yourself, like, no, I can't do this. Like either against like your own kind of like imposter syndrome or preconceived notions or like uh, pushing back against like other folks who, who might've yeah. like doubted you. Yeah, thank you for, yeah. This is, this is an amazing question as well. Um, I love this. So I, I can just speak from my own experience. I felt and still feel imposter syndrome somewhat constantly. Um, when I first sat down and started thinking about this abstraction question for my thesis, I definitely had this, I had the sense that I, I could not, there's no way I can make progress on this question because it felt kind of out of reach. And I said, I can't do this. I can't see myself sitting down and, and doing this. I read actually um, a paper by Strell uh, and, and colleagues, uh, uh, some stuff in that space. And I looked at these papers and just thought, how did they do this? What, like, this looks like absolute magic to me that people can sit down and come up with, with beautiful things like this. Um, so all that just to say, I have deeply experienced this regularly throughout my, my research career. Um, and my, my advisor was super supportive and very, uh, very good about like, giving me positive uh, reinforcements and telling me that I could do things and, and letting me work on stuff. Um, and so it was, I, I can't attribute it to, to an advisor, for instance, or something like that. Um, I get the sense that that is widespread and very common in research in general, um, because by its nature, you're always asking things that we don't know yet. And so it, it forces you in this position where you, you don't know something and that's, I think it puts you on your heels and makes you think, shoot, I don't know this. How could I ever know this? Um, hmm. Let's see. So beyond it being, I, I think, omnipresent, I, I don't know if I have like a magic, a magic recipe for this either. Um, but I think coming back to the social element of research, working with people, one thing to pay attention to is like what people help bring out your confidence and help bring out the fact that they believe in you and they, they want to hear your ideas and your thoughts. Um, I have, I have found a few of those collaborators in the past and I've always really enjoyed those collaborations that they, uh, you know, we'll be working on a whiteboard together and I'll, I'll say something that I'm, I'm very unsure of and they'll say, Oh, wow, that's a cool idea. And I'm like, was it? There's no way. Really? Okay. Thanks. Um, 
So I think having people around you that can be supportive, again, this, this aspect of research that's social, having that supportive community is, is really important. Um, so that's maybe one thing to say. Yeah, Let's thank see. you. It's, yeah, I mean, right, like it's, it's hard to have like a one size fits all answer of like, well, here's what you need to do to become more confident. But I think for me, particularly, it, it's really nice to, to hear just even, you know, that folks at Google and who already like went through the PhD process, like have had these feelings and might continue to have these feelings, right? Like that we're not necessarily alone, but it, I think it's important to kind of um, bring that out, right? Because the more people are aware that other people feel the same way, like the easier it is, I think, to talk about it and kind of move past it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, totally and, and for context, you know, of course, David would never say this because it, it would, uh, but yeah, David's one of the most successful PhD students in the past 10 years at Brown in terms of publications. Whoa. I mean, I was there for seven years. Thanks, I, I in terms of publications, <laughs> it's a true statement. Um, and not only David, but uh, a whole bunch of other incredible researchers, especially within machine learning and NLP, uh, were interviewed. There was this great project. I just posted a link to it in the chat. Uh, I just discovered this like a few weeks ago, and I think it's incredible. It, so to Paulina's point, uh, there's this awesome professor named Debbie Perik, Perik, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but she interviewed these top NLP machine learning folks and very asked very personal and kind of just humanity level questions. And it was just so cool to see the responses from, from them. And oftentimes one of the questions was, do you ever feel imposter syndrome? So from the few that I've watched, all of them have been like, yes, of course, including like Jeff Dean, who's like director of all of uh, research at Google. Um, so yeah, it's, we all feel it at some point. Um, and yeah, just like what David said, I don't have any magic solution, but I think something that I've identified to help mitigate it is if you're working, it's just, it's more of correlation as instead of causation. But if you're working on something that you are truly passionate about, it might allow one, it might just be more conducive to not caring about how one is perceived in terms of their stuff. Um, like you're, you're less critical of your ideas because you're so passionate that you kind of just care about the work itself. I think there tends to be a correlation there, but it's no magic fix either. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Excellent. So any I had a question. questions or comments? I had a question, ma'am. Maybe along those same lines is um, how much effort do you put into trying to keep up with the latest innovations in the fields and how hard is that since things are moving so fast? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question as well, definitely. So I, I will say that when I started my PhD, I want to say there were there was at least on archive the CSML thread, I think there were something like 10 to 15 new papers a day. I, I don't know what that number is at now, but I, I've, the last I looked, it was well over several hundred. Um, so it's, it's a quick moving field. There's tons of stuff going on. And I think it's, at some point I decided it was not worth trying to, to stay fully up to date with everything. Um, it's, it's just not plausible. Um, that being said, there are resources, I think, for getting a nice big update and big overview. So every so often, I mean, I think conferences were a nice cadence uh, to do this, watching a tutorial. And I, I don't work much with um, in NLP, for instance, in language, but seeing a tutorial on what's going on in language I think could be really powerful once a year or once every couple of years or something like that. Um, so for the most part, my reading is mostly focused on my narrow area. Um, or maybe the narrow area of a particular project I'm working on. And I read maybe a, one to two papers a week or something like that. Um, I, I tend to like reading groups for that reason, just to go, go through papers with folks over uh, on a consistent basis. But as far as really staying on top of the, the kind of pulse of the community, to me, the best place to have done that was, was conferences in the past um, or these kinds of keynotes that, that summarize the, the grand vision of folks working at conferences, of what, what they were thinking about or working on uh, for the past year or five years or so. Um, 
And so maybe to summarize, I think finding your niche and like reading deeply in that niche, but not necessarily the latest and greatest stuff. I think relying on your, your community, you can, you can ping folks. If you have a friend that works in an area, what's the best paper in this area that's come out in the last two years that can be really effective. Um, I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've used that quite a lot. Um, in fact, if, if y'all have like Slack channels or, or other sorts of mediums where you have groups of, of folks that all kind of think about similar things, you can just use that as a way to find the right things to read. But um, I think there's too much coming out right now, of course, to stand on top of it. So I, I have cited maybe more toward the end of completely giving up hope on keeping on top of everything and just doing my best to sample the, the right things for my, my current projects. Thank you, it does seem overwhelming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the interviews with the uh, the other folks that I mentioned uh, in terms of, yeah, like the top NLP and machine learning folks, they said the same thing. And, and especially when they talk about things that they feel a bit insecure or yeah, something like that, or something they wish they could change. It's always like, I wish I could stay up to date on stuff, but I just can't. It's like a drinking from a fire hose. For, for concrete numbers, just for kicks, um, in 1997, ACL, so one of the top NLP conferences, had 264 submitted papers. It's now an order of magnitude more. Now it's in the, the 2000s. <laughs> um, and the, that, yeah, that growth was mainly in the past uh, 10 years, because even 10 years ago, it was still like 600. It's gone from 600 to, to 2000 pretty quickly. Yeah. All right, any final questions? I know we, uh, I know it was a long time, but this was just a wealth of great stuff, David. So, so thanks again, um, I really appreciate it and uh, Glad to hear that, that you're at DeepMind doing, doing great stuff and look forward to seeing your upcoming research in the next year or so. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. And yeah, thanks again, Chris, for having me. And th thanks you all for the discussions and questions. That was a ton of fun. Cool. Thank all you. right. Sign Talk off. To you later. Take care, everybody.